Welcome back to my channel at long last. But I thought I would try a different approach. I know it's been a while, uh, quite a while, and it's been quite a hot minute. Um, but here I am again, ready to pay tribute to yet another wonderful Renaissance artist. And if you haven't already um, been familiarized with my channel, I, I do focus on European Renaissance painters, but I, from time to time, I do like to jump out of that period and look at other artists as well. And um, I am uh, trying to build up a, how do I say, an agenda where I will be going into galleries and museums and trying to highlight other artists from probably this period and um, share that with you here on this channel. So it's going to be a mixture. And I was working on um, a tutorial on how to make money as a living by, um, by restoring art. And that's in the works. I, I have it mapped out. I just haven't put it together yet. And so, um, my goodness, it's been months and months since I last uploaded. So I do apologize. And Happy New Year. Um, wishes, best wishes to everybody out there. And so uh, for my um, focus today, I would like to look at the Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance painter and printer, Peter Brugel the Elder, um, a Netherlandish artist uh, from, um, he was born in 1530. So um, I, I would like to start by first making, clarifying a couple of objectives. Uh, number one, uh, this objective will be to focus on the nature of um, Northern Renaissance art and Northern art, probably Northern art in general, um, and the way that the main way that it differs from Western Renaissance art. And um, another objective will be to show everybody um, how important the political context, and I've gone over this a hundred million times in my channel before, um, how political, social political context really defines the artist and really defines the art of the artist. So, um, uh, let's keep that in mind as we go through Peter Brugel's uh, painting. And um, Census at Bethlehem will be the um, focus of this particular discussion today. And it was done in 1566 after Peter Brugel returned from Italy. Um, and he did receive his training in Rome. And it would almost be that um, uh, he probably trained in, in uh, I would say he would he would have trained in Raphael's um, workshop because Raphael was also a printer and engraver before he became a, a painter. Um, but Raphael passed away in 1521 and Brugel was born in 1530. So they missed each other. But the art is, is um, quite... Um, it, it, it's the same sort of genre of, well, what I mean to say is that they both started out as printers and engravers, and so um, both of their careers took off from there. And I, I want to also clarify one more point, in, and that is that Peter Brugel, the elder, wasn't the first painter um, to come up with the snowy, um, okay, he probably was the first painter to come up with the snowy scenes that were um, uh, related to the nativity story and Christmas, but um, he was not the absolute first artist to um, base 
his content around everyday peasant life. So then, um, bottom line is Peter Bujo the Elder was born in fifth, around 1530, at least by 1525, because the records guys are not very, um, they're just not there. And so um, he was a Northern Renaissance Dutch Flemish painter, and uh, he was a printmaker who became known for his focus on daily peasant life and landscape in his large-scale works, and that would be his paintings. And so um, in this video, we will discuss that one particular painting, Census at Bethlehem, which was done in 1566. And um, it Guys, it became famous for its beautiful white snowy landscape. And it wasn't the only snowy landscape painting that Bujo came out with. Uh, I think it really made him very well loved and popular and famous all at once. And um, people like to compare his son's work. Now, his son was born many years after Brujo began painting. And um, Brujo never got a chance to get to know his son's work. But many people do like to compare the father to the son. For today, we'll just focus on the dad. <laughs> so um, he was born into an era of very, very rapid change. Um, this change, or these changes, rather, were pretty predominant in both the Western and Northern spheres of culture. And so uh, Italy would have been the number one uh, push for these changes. And, you know, the Protestant Reformation was something that had been going on uh, for a while. And it would, um, it would really, um, it would really, how do I say this? It would really, um, become the incentive for much more change in art, especially, and culture. And so um, uh, he very heavily influenced Dutch golden painting, which would have been the style of painting that came after his era. So um, he was a pretty important guy in the Flemish Dutch world of art. And um, so one of the first things that I noticed about this particular painting, um, the first of many things that I noticed, and uh, first of all, I want to say that I have read articles um, based on other people's findings of this um, painting, and it was very helpful. They were very helpful. Um, I, I could list them in, in the bottom description below. Uh, if anybody is interested in following up, they're online. At least one of them is. And so um, the one most pressing um, element of this painting is that it is very, very, very detailed. And the detail of that painting actually... Um, defines the cultural um, background of where the community is based and um, all the village activities that were going on at the time that Brujo, well, I, I, I'm not sure that this is a still life. I'm pretty sure most of it is imaginary and most of it was created by um, the artist's uh, imagination, which is that, that was what the, his subject matter was, peasant life. But in a way, he also um, wanted to address and, and focus on the religious element of his theme, which was nativity. And so, Along with that detail, another most important element that I realized, and actually that has been noted by other people, um, is that his painting was done in a style that is um, 
known as a world landscape style. And so um, you can see this style uh, also in Western art. Uh, for instance, the Bellini brothers did a wonderful job of displaying that st style of, of painting. And so did Leonardo da Vinci, even though maybe at the time of Leonardo da Vinci and these other painters, um, it had not become a typical trend. Um, it, it was the same sort of idea, if you get my drift. So before I, I show you examples of the world landscape style and other examples of um, Bujo's painting, I, excuse that, I would like to um, first go over some of the first parts of Bujo's life, his earlier career. And um, so he trained uh, in Italy. He traveled to and trained in Italy, first as a printmaker, and entered the painting guild later on in 1551. So um, after 1555, he left Italy and returned to Netherlands, and he focused on oil painting. And so although he did not follow the typical venue of study of painting, which was classical, which was classical um, sculpture and architecture, um, you know, classical ruins. Um, he he did he did um, study painting, and so it's another important fact that um, he didn't paint. Uh, Virgil did not paint in the earlier. Uh, part of his life. What he did was he was a printmaker engraver, and but all of his paintings, it's so strange that all of his paintings happen to have been captured on canvas during the last 10 years of his life, the last decade of his life. And that would be when his sons were born. So, um, he, you know, he did paint. He did try to paint. He did paint in Italy. Um, he wasn't, what happened was there was a Turkish raid, and basically in the town, in the hometown where my father was, Reggio Calabria, and there was a Turkish raid, everything was destroyed. So whatever paintings Bujol did have, um, you know, they were they were uh, damaged, and it's it's very interesting that Bujo did not follow the typical venue of um, classical studies because in Reggio Calabria, um, that is where all the classical ruins were. So I'm not. I, it's fascinating that Bujo was there and Bujo painted, but maybe he did focus on classical ruins, and it's just that his art did not survive. So there's a mystery there. And because there's a mystery, I'm all the more intrigued to find out more about this painter. So, and so um, the biographers who commented on Bujo's period and Bujo himself uh, declared that, um, you know, first of all, um, because a lot of his um, time was spent in Italy, it wasn't it, properly documented, and his early life is quite a mystery. We don't know what kind of origins um, Bujo did come from. Uh, some speculate that he was from a uh, born of a peasant class, um, which is okay. Um, others believe that he was born of a high status and that he did indeed have a worldly humanist education. We don't know. We don't know. I'm certainly a little of both. Um, he did have a very deep sympathy and empathy for the peasant world, um, the peasant class. And even in those days, everybody... Um, the peasants were undergoing such a revolution after the pandemic, um, which I discussed in my other channel yesterday, very briefly. Um, you know, the bubonic plague brought about so much change 
and it brought about a, a revolution of um you know with the workers and the farmers and laborers and whatever have you so um it was for very many reasons a time of very rapid change socially and politically so going back to Bujo's style um he specialized in very minute and particular details and he devised a calendar and he devised very many um, images for um, illuminated manuscripts, all of which featured very ordinary, everyday and peasant life. And these illuminated manuscripts um, and the paintings themselves, they all had a very spiritual and often a religious theme, uh, but it was hidden in all the everyday, typical everyday activities of peasant life that you would find or you would encounter walking through a peasant village in Renaissance um, in Renaissance and the Renaissance Netherlands. So um, getting back to the landscape style, um, it was also used by as I said, other high Renaissance artists. And uh, Raphael was one of those painters. Da Vinci was another. And, you know, I think that we could come to identify a lot of its features as uh, part of the Danube school. And I can also think of a few YouTube painters um, who exhibit that same sort of style and their very own unique way. I think it's so beautiful uh, because I love nature, I love landscape, and I love it when artists, not me, <laughs> I'm not an artist, when artists can capture that same reality and put it on canvas, that is magic. That is absolutely magical. And so, um, Virgil did widely use the trendy style of the Danube school, which became coined as the world landscape style. And um, he was one of the first to typify it in the Northern Renaissance. And um, it, it, it was beautiful in a way because it included imagined or idealized natural elements of a, a panoramic landscape. And um, for instance, Raphael would fuzzy out the outlines of mountains and hills and whatever have you in the distance. So that was one typical trait of, um, uh, it became even more popularized with Roman uh, romantic painting later on in the 1800s. But, um, it, it was it was idealized. It was idealistic. It was imagined. It was created. It was it, it created the feeling that this was a perfect world and this was what life really could be like, if only everything was perfect. So um, it was almost like an escape, if you will, from real life. Um. So. Um. Part of the objective then uh, that I want to um, fulfill is that um, all painters and paintings reveal a context. Now I've gone over this political context and the importance of political, social political context in terms of painters, whether they be young, old, male or female. And I did try to connect um, the importance of that context with another, for example, female artist who was very popular during the lifetime of Michelangelo, and her name was Sophonisba Anguissola. I featured her uh, earlier in this channel, and so her context goes precisely with Brugel's, and that would be the Habsburg court and its uh, control you know, the Spanish court and its control over all the other um, 
uh, situations that were occurring in the world at that time. And so a lot of it was conquest. A lot of it was um, taking in people as slaves. It must have been horrible. It must have been horrible. But I know that... Um, you know, the Spanish were very adamant about making everybody follow civilized law, and people weren't. I'm not saying that it was an excuse. It was not, it was not a good excuse to take away people's livelihoods and lives and create them as slaves, you know, to take a person's life and recreate it the way you want because you want to see the world in a specific way. Um, to me, that was a very harsh and cruel way to um, deal blows. But that was what was going on in the world of art during the Renaissance. And many, many painters protested this. And, and even Sophonisba was protesting this. It, if it weren't for her um, and her humanistic attitudes, uh, she would never have been able to influence the court. I, I, I don't think that she managed to do it quickly and, and harshly enough, but uh, she did make a difference. And so Brutal's context is similar to Sophonisba and Whistler's. And the Netherlands were reeling from the influences of this harsh Spanish conquest this war that was taking over the world, and many people couldn't understand it. Um, they couldn't. And, you know, uh, there are several scenes in, in Boozle's paintings which depict the slaughter of animals. Well, I, I think he was trying to give us a very explicit message there. And, you know, it, it, this was his way of decrying the war. And I, I applaud him for that. I applaud all artists for that. And it's a shame that many of the artists who were so influential um, in the political world were by them deceased. And so it's sad. It's sad in a way. Um, Raphael died extremely young, extremely young. I, I'm sure that he would have decried it as well. Um, he was against many social barriers, and um, he would have he would have put up a fight with this too, but um, who knows what might have happened. Anyway, um, so uh, Bujo was painting in the world landscape style, and you could see for, from the example, for instance, that I just gave you that he also um, he also decried all the changes that were being forced upon. Um, you know, people in general, uh, in order to pacify the Spanish. And so that's how it goes. So Virgil's other painting, Landscape with the Flight into Egypt, also depicts the same snowy uh, world landscape style. And I, I really think um, it, he was the first um, to depict Christmas with snow and whiteness. And it, it's so interesting to think like that and to think about that. And, um, you know, his um, he also had seasonal imagery in that painting with more peasant figures and more activities that typified um, community life then and there. And... Um, he used that same landscape style, which I, I think really complemented his messages. And um, so of all the focus of Bujo's expression was to um, portray the daily life of village peasantry, his themes did um, bring in a religious focus and um, so the painting uh, that's called The Census at Bethlehem, in a nutshell, um, is, is a reinvention of the nativity story, which occurred thousands and thousands of years before, or hundreds of years before, I should say. 
And um, he tried to depict it as a modern phenomenon that was going on right then and there in the middle of all this bustling peasant life. And I, I think that is so advanced, so ahead of his times, guys. Um, if you think about it the way that I have, it, it's almost as though he created a hologram because um, we're going to celebrate this this event for many, many, many more hundreds of years to come. And so in a way, we are, all of us, we are participating in some sort of hologram. So um, he had it right on. He had it right on. Uh, you know, when you think of it as a phenomenon in that particular way, it, it takes on a real, a really... I don't know how to say this, a really different complex meaning. And, um, you know, all of this activity, which would have happened to have been occurring on a snowy December day back then in the Netherlands, um, also uh, went back to refer to that um, ancient event that took part between Jesus Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, the three wise men, and whatever else have you. And so um, it was all uh, incorporated into a timeless sort of um, context. And um, it, it seems to me that this timelessness is really, really what makes Brugel's painting so famous and so well-loved. Um, I, I'm never, never, uh, I can never be more or enough amazed at the way that he went about depicting this and what his message, I'm not sure if I even have the entire message um, right, but he really, he really um, did a very, I don't know, a very good job of, of telling us that this special event is part of us. It's part of our lives. It's part of everything. It's part of our future, our past. Uh, it's us. It's us. And so um, what a great painter and what a wonderful message. And so I, I'm going to put together a few little clips just to show you that... Um, you know, what the world landscape uh, style is. And I want to show you um, some details of this census in, at Bethlehem painting and, um, you know, give you an idea of how adept Brujo was at um, putting his message on the canvas in such a simple yet complex way. Um, so hold on and I'll show you what I mean and then we'll we'll come back and I'll do my conclusion. said that uh, an example of the landscape of the flight into Egypt was an example of a snowy landscape. That was wrong. Um, no, it's an example of the world landscape style. Um, instead, in the little clip that I showed you, I did include other examples of snowy landscapes by Brujo. And so um, to conclude this, um, I think that um, one of the scenes in, in um, 
the um, census at Bethlehem shows a group of people. Um, they were, uh, they looked as though they were all consulting with each other or doing something very official. And despite it being a holiday, even in the Netherlands at, um, during the Renaissance, um, I think it does show the oppression of the um, Dutch and Netherlandish people um, resulting from the Spanish rule and they were inflicting or trying to impose very hefty um, taxes on the Dutch people, on the Netherlands populace. And the peasants were very hard hit. And so it's so interesting that um, Virgil decided to include this detail just to, um, huh, how do I say, um, conclude or just to affirm his um, outlook on, on the Spanish rule and uh, his sympathy with the general populace. And it's, it's not clear how hard Bujo himself was hit if he suffered with all these taxes. It's not clear at all, but it's very clear that he did sympathize and empathize with the general populace. And, um, so the, the fact that he did um, include this in his painting is wonderful because now we have a way to um, define it one step further. And um, all those little scenes that were taking place within the entire painting, uh, they all sum up uh, the total of um, Brugel's outlook on life and peasant life. Uh, in this little village or town that was filled with peasants. And so um, it's wonderful also that he chose to highlight this very holy um, occasion in such a wonderfully typical painting, uh, an everyday occurrence um, that was all those um, ordinary occurrences that were going around um, and in, in, in right around this phenomenal birth that had just taken place. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to look at um, the Holy Story. I think it's, it's wonderful that he thought of it that way. And um, I, I think he also wanted to draw us closer to um, the Holy Event in his own way. And, um, you know, no matter where we are or what we're doing, we're always going to be part of that event, aren't we? So um, anyway, I hope that everybody has enjoyed this content. And um, I'm not sure when I will be uploading again. I hope to try to make this a more regular occurrence. Um, there's an awful lot of research that goes on in these um, typical uh, little, I don't know if you will, tutorials or little scenarios that I, I like to do. And um, so I hope that you did enjoy that little clip that I had for you as well. Uh, I hope that um, I, I can upload it and, and edit it all properly. So I'm trying out this new format and I hope it's a little more successful than the format that I was giving you before. I think I combined um, format with both methods um, is really essential for something like this, that, you know, the content that I want to cover is not always easy or very understandable. Um, so I like going into it a little bit sometimes. Anyway, um, if, if you do like this content, um, please give it a thumbs up. And um, also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.